The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our Better Buildings webinar series today. Uh, we're going to jump in and get started right away. We have a lot of presenters um, and a lot of exciting information to present to you. So hello, everyone. I'm Cedar Blazik with the U.S. Department of Energy's Better Buildings Initiative. I'd like to welcome you to this December edition of the Better Buildings webinar series. In this series, we profile the best practices of Better Buildings Challenge and Alliance partners and other organizations working to improve energy efficiency in buildings. Next slide. Today, we will hear about the recent work of the Better Buildings Technology Research Teams and how they can benefit your organization. These leaders at our national research laboratories are working with Better Buildings partners to advance technologies related to space conditioning, lighting, plug loads, building envelope, and energy management information systems. Before we get started with our presentations, I want to remind our audience that we will hold questions until near the end of the hour. Please send in your questions through the chat box on your webinar screen throughout the session today, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. The session will be archived and posted to the web for your reference. Next slide. So uh, let me introduce our first presenter today. Uh, Dr. Jessica Granderson is a staff scientist and the Deputy of Research Programs for the Building Technology and Urban Systems Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She is a member of the whole Building Systems Department. Dr. Granderson holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from UC Berkeley and an AB in Mechanical Engineering from Harvard University. Her research focuses on building energy performance monitoring and diagnostics, advanced measurement and verification, and intelligent lighting controls. She is the recipient of the 2015 Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Award for Leadership and Research, and today she'll be talking about the EMIS Technology Research Team. Jessica, take it away. Thank you. So first I wanted to start just by defining EMIS, for those not familiar with the term. These are a broad family of technologies coupled with services to manage uh, building energy use. They offer across the board a mix of capabilities to store, analyze, and display both energy use as well as systems data, and in some cases also provide control. Next slide. Our driving goal is to conduct R&D that will support the adoption or the expanded use of EMIS. We uh, combine here at the laboratory both our technical expertise and market intelligence to uh, connect utilities, the owner and operator community, and vendors of commercial tools. Our work really spans uh, from the development of new analytical approaches all the way into field validation and identification of best practice uses. In that way, we uh, provide knowledge and technology transfer to facilitate market push as well as market pull. Next slide. Here's some examples of different types of EMIS just to give a real concrete visual on the technologies of focus for this team. On the upper left, you'll see a screen capture of a monthly utility bill analysis and benchmarking tool. Um, these may be designed for uh, building specific use or for a full portfolio. Moving clockwise, uh, there's uh, an image from a fault detection and diagnostics technology. These really focus on uh, usually HVAC control system and operational data to uh, identify uh, problems with the systems and recommend uh, fixes or responding course of action. Uh, continuing clockwise, the uh, energy information systems are also just meter analytics tools. They usually take a portfolio or whole building level view uh, using whole building meter data and the incorporation of submeter data. And then on the bottom, of, bottom left, you'll see the kind of workhorse of commercial building operations, the building automation system. So, that's kind of the composition of technologies we're talking about. Next slide, please. 
resources we develop on this team include uh, those that have a kind of document flavor as well as webinars. And I'm listing just a couple of more recent examples. We've uh, characterized uh, the market for automated fault diagnostics tools, um, defined how we can use the technology uh, to identify the top opportunities for savings in commercial buildings, and application examples, uh, one here being from a large corporate enterprise deploying a smart buildings program across their global facilities. Webinars that we host feature guests as well as lab researchers, and they cover things like best practice and lessons learned, moving beyond dashboards with our meter analytics and exemplary success stories. Next slide. In addition to resources we, uh, that we develop, we conduct targeted investigations. Uh, one recent example being an update of a very comprehensive study on the cost effectiveness of commissioning. This is a 10-year-old study that's routinely cited to make the business case for uh, commissioning project implementation or program deployment. Um, we've updated it with new information for projects that have been completed in the last seven years um, and expanded it to now cover uh, the largest database of cost, benefits, and measures identified, um, almost 1,500 buildings or projects, uh, and nearly 400 million square feet encompassed under this study. Next slide, please. Our main ongoing activity is the Smart Energy Analytics Campaign. Um, through the campaign, we provide technical assistance as well as recognition and peer learning uh, to organizations who are either just starting or well underway with their EMIS implementation. Uh, this study represents the largest data set that we know on the uh, use of EMIS, the costs of using EMIS, the savings and specific measures that are identified through technology implementation. We're currently working with uh, 77 organizations who represent over 400 million square feet of install space. Um, and we welcome new participants. Um, I'm providing here on the slide a link. You can peruse the website and see how to get involved. Next slide, please. Recognition uh, of our participants' successes is a really important component of the campaign. Um, we confer recognition twice a year uh, through public presentations uh, at industry events. Uh, we also document these, um, uh, document the recognition through case studies and push those publications out to the community at large. Just some examples of the last round of recognition, uh, Clyde's Properties, Cary and Stanford University dining and, and residence. We looked here at um, very standout applications of meter analytics or fault diagnostics at a single site, um, in the Stanford case across a full portfolio. Next slide, please. We're expanding our work with two new efforts this year that I wanted to mention just to um, give a, a little more example of the uh, ground that our team covers. So one effort that I'm really excited for is to work um, directly with fault diagnostics te technology software providers as well as service providers to develop and test automated approaches to correct faults and um, thereby implement autonomous commissioning. The second project uh, looks at machine learning combined with unstructured data. So that's things like um, images, thermal images or satellite images, um, or things like disclosure records or permitting records. Um, to use those new data sources and machine learning techniques to enhance the energy analytics that we have available to us today in commercial offerings. 
so I really encourage folks to reach out to us with your questions or interests, specifically where um, your work has strong alignment with our expertise. That's um, topics like monitoring-based commissioning, meter-based savings measurement and verification, operational efficiency very broadly, um, as well as organizational process, machine learning, and statistics. So there I will thank you for your time and look forward to connecting with some of you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And just a note, at the end of the presentation, I will have the emails for all of our presenters um, in case you want to reach out directly. Uh, so now we'll hear from our next presenter. Uh, Kim Trenbath is an industrial engineer in the Buildings and Thermal Sciences Center at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She's a co-lead for the U.S. Department of Energy's Better Buildings Alliance Plug-in Process Loads technical team. Her current research includes plug-in process loads in commercial buildings, building fault detection and diagnostics, and zero energy buildings. She's on the management team for the ongoing buildings-related Jump into STEM student competition. Dr. Trembath is also an adjunct professor at the Colorado School of Mines. Kim, tell us about the latest with the plug-in process load team. Thanks, Cedar. Hello, everybody. Um, all right, I'm here to give you an introduction to the resources that we have for plug-in process loads, the research that we do, and how these can benefit you. I'm going to start out with an introductory question. Of all the building end uses, which do you think will use the most energy in 2040? Well, since I have the floor, I'm going to answer my own question, and it is plug-in process loads. We'll, found out, we'll find out more on the next slide. So currently, PPLs, the abbreviation for plug-in process loads, make up 40% of whole building energy use in U.S. commercial buildings, and this is expected to increase to 49% in the year 2040. So why the increase? Well, first of all, other building systems such as HVAC, lighting, and building envelope are going to become more and more efficient, so they're going to have a smaller slice of the energy use pie. And then there's going to, we expect more and more plug loads to come online, and these include increases to audiovisual equipment um, and other plug-in devices such as phones and electronics. So now may be a good time to start looking into plug-in process load efficiencies in addition to your other building end uses. Next slide, please. So PPLs include plug-in and hardwired electric or gas loads that are not associated with HVAC, lighting, water heating, or other major building equipment needed for basic building operations. You can see some examples of these plug-in process loads on this slide. Um, process, slides also, process loads also include equipment for commercial and industrial processes. And an example of this would be um, vertical transportation in your commercial building like elevators or escalators. There's many, many individual loads and they are sometimes small, so they are very hard to track and sometimes very hard to control. There are also challenges that relate to human interaction with plug loads that make them hard to deal with if you are a building owner or a manager. These challenges also make this building end use interesting and a good candidate for research and improvement. Uh, the PPL tech te technical team has a number of resources that can help you understand the plug loads in your building and how they impact your energy use and strategies that you can employ to be more energy efficient. Next slide, please. The plug and process load technical team is a team of professionals dedicated to finding and improving PPL efficiencies in commercial buildings. This team comes from a variety of organizations, from technology developers to researchers to building owners. This also includes utilities, regional energy efficiency organizations, and energy efficiency consultants. NREL is the team lead and facilitates the collaboration with the support of our subcontractor, Waypoint Energy. NREL leads a biannual webinar for the technical research team so that they can learn more about current PPL strategies. And we also have a strategic working group which focuses on research, both quantitative energy savings, for example, energy savings from specific strategies, and qualitative, for example, how building occupants interact with PPL control technologies. And we would love for you to join us. And if you're interested, please sign up by um, emailing, emailing Katie Vrabel at the email that you see um, below. Um, really, the commitment there pretty much is no commitment if you sign up. What we're going to do is we're going to send you um, a little bit of information about our technical team talk calls and let us know if we and let uh, you know if we have any meetups at any um, conferences. So we would love to have you. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> the PPL technical research team works to collaborate with industry professionals focused on PPL efficiency, investigate questions valuable to building owners and industry, and communicate knowledge and efficiency strategies through resources and presentations. I'm going to talk about each of these three things in a little more detail in the following slides. Next slide. <clears throat> there are a number of ways that we collaborate. First of all, we have biannual webinars, which I mentioned before. Um, during these biannual webinars, we present on technical topics related, relating to PPLs, such as um, strategies, best practices, and new technologies. Past topics on the BB um, on the biannual webinar include building submetering, site demonstrations, and user interactions with and with PPLs, as well as cybersecurity. You can find recordings of the prior webinars on the BBA website. We also organize conference get-togethers at conferences such as the ACEEE Summer Study and the Better Buildings Summit. Um, sometimes we meet for dinner where we are able to casually talk about some of the plug load strategies that we're implementing in our buildings. We also have one-to-one -one calls. If you're, interesting, if you're interested in getting um, a little bit more detailed information, we are willing to um, meet with you and talk to you about the resources that we have, a bit of, the resources that we have available. We're also interested in um, finding out about your building's needs and um, ways that we can collaborate. Um, one of the ways that we could potentially collaborate are from um, field tests still study test sites. Um, so if you have a good site where you're going to implement a um, PPL control strategy, perhaps we can do a field study with you. Next slide. We investigate two lines. Well, right now we're investigating two areas of research. One is wireless meter and controls for plug loads or smart outlets. Um, the, um, and that's the first column that you see there. Uh, we recently released a publication through ACEEE um, Summer Study Proceedings on Navigating Cybersecurity Implications of Smart Outlets. And we are about to release a technical, technical report on the um, GSA Proving Grounds field study with a wireless meter control and technology from IBIS Networks. Um, another line of research that we focus on is integrated controls for um, meter and control devices. And um, in this line, we're working on a landscaping study, which will be published as an NREL technical report, um, and it's called Integrating Smart PPL Controls into EMIS Platforms. In this study, we have characterized um, things that are needed for integration and interoperability of PPL platforms with EMIS platforms, and also identify future, future research needs. Um, other areas that we're going to be working on in the future um, are in the integrated control space and also on learning behavior algorithm and automatic device identification. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We've also recently published a paper in Intelligent Buildings International, and this is on the energy savings and usability of zero client computing in office settings. Um, we did a study and we looked at zero clients compared to traditional work uh, Stations, and we found that zero clients um, use 16 to 31% less energy than traditional workstations during occupied hours. However, when you factor in the data center energy use, um, zero clients use a little bit more energy, um, but this is specific to one building and also one data center. So data centers and laptops are becoming more and more efficient. So um, our findings um, were, we're a case study, but it will be different for each building. Next slide. <clears throat> so we communicate our findings through presentations um, at conferences such as the Better Building Summit, ACEEE, and Better Plants Day. And we also communicate our findings through resources. And I want to bring your attention to the resources. Look down on the bottom of this slide and you see a web link um, and this is a this is a link to our web page associated with the Better Buildings Alliance. On that page, you can find a number of resources that can help you with um, controlling plug loads in your buildings. Um, examples include a decision guide for PPL controls by sector, step-by-step um, -step process for assess assessing and reducing plug loads in office buildings, and a list of utility incentives related to PPLs. Next slide. 
I want to thank you for listening to us today, and um, I want to show you how you can get involved. I've talked about a handful of these things on this slide um, earlier, um, but you can get involved by, first of all, joining the technical research team and just email ppl at waypoint-energy.com. Um, Another one I want to bring your attention to is participating in the interior lighting campaign um, innovation category. You'll hear about the interior lighting campaign later on in this presentation, but they're, um, they are um, launching a new category, which is controls for plug loads in addition to lighting together. And so if you are doing some work in this area for some of your buildings, feel free to apply to the um, ILC innovation category. Um, so we look forward to hearing for, from you. Um, again, ppl at waypoint-energy.com um, if you're interested in um, joining. And thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, next slide, please. And next up, we're going to hear from the space conditioning team. Michael DeRue is a senior engineer in the Building Energy Science Group at NREL. Michael leads the Space Conditioning Project Team and the Advanced Rooftop Unit Campaign for the Department of Energy and manages projects on the development and testing of novel HVAC systems, building performance simulations, performance metrics for sustainability, source energy and emissions factors, water, and the U.S. Life Cycle Inventory Database. Michael Drew holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the Colorado State University. Michael, you're up. Great, thanks, Cedar, and hello, everyone. So the Space Conditioning Technology Team, um, first we're gonna talk about <clears throat> rooftop units and the, all the work that we do in that space. So um, if you're not aware we um, the, of the Advanced RTU campaign, um, that is our campaign to promote all things high efficiency um, with our rooftop units. So high efficiency rooftop unit installations and replacements, um, advanced control retrofits, quality installation, quality maintenance, and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, down below, but it's automated fault detection, diagnostics, and intelligent control. Um, if you go to advancedrtu.org, there's uh, um, several resources and information about the campaign, <clears throat> resources for building owners, um, for uh, contractors for utilities and um, manufacturers around the technology and the business cases for um, high efficiency rooftop units. And um, we are getting ready to announce uh, in January, we'll be announcing our, our new round of recognition awards. So uh, we will be announcing those winners at the PRISM conference in uh, April, on April 30th, 2019. Um, and every year we do this annually, and um, so look forward to that announcement coming out soon. And through the um, Advanced Rooftop Unit Campaign, we're also conducting a, a field study of automated fault detection diagnostics that are being used uh, with rooftop units. And so we've, we've interviewed several um, manufacturers and contractors and building owners and we're still looking for more, especially building owners. Uh, if you have um, rooftop units that, uh, and you're using <clears throat> AFDD technology, please, uh, and you're interested in participating, please let me know. You can email me um, and let us know. And then we will be preparing that report and, and soon and, and having, hopefully that'll be coming out in early 2019. Um, and then we're also going to be, uh, looking to collect real-time data, so understanding the data that are collected from AFDD systems and and how that data are used, and, and uh, hopefully, um, if you are interested in participating in that, let me know as well. Um, and then a new project that uh, is related to advanced controls is um, RTU coordination. So what that means is if you, you know, Typical rooftop may have, you know, anywhere from three to 50 rooftop units. Um, and typically they are controlled independently and they may be controlled just by a local thermostat, but there's no coordination between the operation of those rooftop units. And so we see uh, a great opportunity there to optimize that control to um, minimize energy, uh, minimize the peak demand, um, 
provide improved um, thermal comfort and, and improve cost savings and reduce cycle time on those rooftop units. So we'll be starting that with some lab testing here this year, or this uh, in 2019, and then looking to start some field testing in 2019 and 2020. So that's an exciting project we're, we're uh, getting ready to start up. Uh, next slide, please. And then on the next slide, uh, we have several technology demonstrations uh, that we'll have reports coming out soon. <clears throat> One um, is with uh, HVAC air cleaning technology. This is a company called Inverid. And this is not just a typical air cleaning because this is a gaseous air cleaning. So it cleans, it removes CO2 and VOCs um, as well as the particulates. But it's, uh, it's challenging to remove CO2, um, and this company has a technology that can do that. So we've completed some field testing, um, and we're writing up that report right now. And, um, and then the next one is a high-efficiency smart motor. This is with Software Motor Company, and we did some testing um, with this particular testing, it was just uh, it was on a refrigeration air conditioner or air air condenser. So it was replacing the fan motors for that uh, condenser motors, and that report will be coming out uh, as well in 2019. Um, and then we've completed um, cooling uh, several studies on different technologies with uh, cooling tower water treatment systems. Um, so most of those were completed with uh, uh, General Services Administration or the GSA, and then some with uh, DOE. And those, there's several GSA reports that are um, in the final review before publication. And then the, G, the DOE report, we're, we're, we're finalizing the analysis and starting the writing that report right now. So those, that report will be coming out in, um, in the spring of 2019. Um, a lot of these resources we, we make available through the HVAC resource map. Um, if you're not familiar with that, please go check it out. This is for um, large uh, HVAC systems, so central plants with chillers and boilers and so on. And some of the, a lot of these resources will be made available there. There's also several other resources there. Um, this is a graphical interface that allows you to, to zero in on different aspects of the of your HVAC plan and find out more information. Um, it starts at a high level and then gets down into more details, but and then provides links uh, to to other um, other information. And we're always looking to improve that. So please let me know if if you have any suggestions. Uh, we'll we'll definitely try to take in, include those. Um, one thing that we are going to be doing, uh, based on all those the cooling tower water treatment system tests and some other water um, related technologies that we're looking at is <clears throat> developing some more resources around um, water management and, and water treatment systems. So look for those to be coming out this year as well. And then we have our um, technology team calls. We'll probably have right now they're tentatively scheduled for February and August. And uh, we're always looking for topics of interest to include in those. So please let me know if you have any suggestions. Um, we'd love to include those. Um, and thank you very much for your time today. That's all I have. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just a quick reminder, everyone, to send in any questions you may have through the webinar chat box on your screen. Uh, we're collecting these for a Q&A period at the end of the session. Now we'll hear from the latest from our Building Envelope team. Melissa Voslapsa leads Oak Ridge National Laboratory's support of the DOE Building Technologies Office Commercial Buildings Integration Program and is director of ORNL's Building Technologies Research and Integration Center, a DOE national user facility. She has over 20 years of experience conducting market research, policy analysis, and institutional and consumer behavior research aimed at deploying cost-effective, energy-efficient technologies. She also leads ORNL's Sustainable Campus Initiative. Uh, Melissa, take it away. Thanks, Cedar. So talking about the, the building envelope, um, it's, it's a complicated system, as we all know, and it accounts for 
one quads of primary energy use, and it encompasses the walls, windows, roof, and foundation, and it forms the primary thermal barrier between the intern, intern, interior and exter, exterior environments. Uh, envelope technologies account for approximately 30% of the primary energy consumed in residential and commercial buildings, playing a key role in determining levels of comfort, natural lighting, ventilation, and how much energy is required to heat and cool a building. So our tech research team is really focused on providing information and resources, conducting research for building owners and managers of commercial buildings uh, to help them make um, the best decisions, most cost-effective decisions for high-performing performance envelope design solutions um, for space conditioning load reduction and to facilitate the construction of durable and high-performing envelope technologies, um, also addressing retrofit opportunities, how to make those best decisions for envelope technologies. Next slide, please. So we have uh, in our national use facility here, we have a lot of envelope experts. And so we have put together on our website toolkits with a lot of information on different technologies, information on air barriers, best practice guidance, um, and we also provide technical expertise. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll inter we also, I won't mention all those names, but we'll keep going. We have 20 mi 29 members of our technology research team of building owners, uh, managers, architects, engineers, you know, including um, Legacy Health, Newmark, Grubb, Knight, Frank, um, Turner Construction, and others. We also have another over 30 members who are affiliated with us that uh, make up the manufacturers, trade association, energy service providers. So collectively, we can share a lot of best practices and also find out where those gaps are for information um, and technology needs that we can provide. Um, and the goal is to basically have those high performance uh, envelope solutions being deployed in new construction and retrofit um, opportunities. Next slide, please. So our current activities across um, our envelope team is that we've heard from our team members that they would like to have more information on commissioning and specifically on closure commissioning, uh, best practices, case studies. Uh, so we've been working uh, with a lot of different associations uh, and information providers to pull this information together. Uh, we've also been working on a building enclosure performance metric, and I'll speak a bit about that on the next slide. We're looking at wall systems and looking at where where that uh, information gap is, um, and we're also analyzing that to see where the opportunities are for active controllable wall systems. We're doing research on composite walls, uh, looking at a multifunctional composite panel for an envelope retrofit that would be cost effective that will combine heat, air, and moisture barrier with the cladding system. And we're also working on window attachments, um, looking, collaborating with the Attachment Energy Rating Council. Next slide, please. So speaking about this uh, performance metric, and we have a lot of information about this uh, put together. There's a link at the bottom, so I won't dive into a lot of detail given our time constraint, but I will mention that, you know, an analogy is miles per gallon with your vehicle. We wanted to, we heard from our team members that they're looking for how do I uh, evaluate the, the effective performance of my enclosure. We all know that it's more than the R value. We need to take a lot more into consideration. And so we are pulling this information together and we are working with our partners. We're doing a lot of research um, with other um, national labs, with industry associations, um, but we're also getting input from um, some of our building owner managers um, providing real world building data. So it's an opportunity for, for them to be a part of this process of our research and then they can utilize the, the results for their um, making their energy efficient, cost effective decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the passive walls, uh, we are, again, doing our research in our um, national use facility, but we're also getting input from our partners on their wall performance data uh, so that we can basically have 
cutting edge information and be able to see where those the, the gaps are, um, categorizing common commercial wall assemblies, identifying simulation model deficiencies, and conducting sensitivity analysis. And all of this will be publicly available information that we will post on our website and do a webinar to showcase the results. Next slide, please. So some of the items that are on our website um, are linked here in these slides. We do have webinars about once a quarter where we bring in um, experts to talk about the latest energy efficient, cost-effective envelope technologies. We've had recent ones on windows and air barrier technologies, um, enclosure systems, and also uh, window attachments, and those are all available online. Um, we have had a half-day workshop at the building, um, Better Building Summit on going deep on enclosure commissioning, and uh, we're adding information on that based on some publications and uh, articles that we've recently released. And we also have ACEEE summer study results on air tightness of commercial buildings um, and a calculator that's new calculator that's available on our website. Uh, next slide, please. So in, close, in closing, I'd like to you know, just uh, reiterate that we have a lot of partners, about over 60 members and affiliate members of our tech research team. Um, our job is, is really to pr help provide best practices, package information that helps building owners and managers um, make you know, quick decisions on where, where to invest in this complicated building envelope system. And, um, enable engagement on the research to uh, enable advancing um, the deployment of energy saving solutions. Uh, so I would encourage anyone who would like to get involved with our team to reach out and email me and uh, we will uh, be able to add you to our team. That's it. Thanks, Cedar. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, finally, let's hear from our lighting and electrical team. Michael Meyer is a lighting analyst and joined the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in 2007. At PNNL, he supports the interior lighting campaign and the lighting and energy efficiency and parking campaign. Beyond these campaigns, Michael supports commercial and federal building projects on lighting needs. In addition to commercial support, Michael has provided technical analysis related to energy codes and appliance standards. Prior to joining PNNL, Michael was an architectural lighting designer. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so I guess I should uh, provide some context here. Lighting is about 10 to 20 percent of the electricity use in your building. It all depends on the age of your building and as we learned with plug loads, um, some of those loads are now uh, outpacing the lighting. Um, significant inroads have been made in energy efficiency and lighting um, the last five years. Uh, that's why that number it has gone down coupled with other loads increasing. Um, but it is a constant need and something that many of you are working on. It's also of the building systems that we've mentioned on this phone call, one of the easier ones to retrofit in an existing building uh, that can be done sometimes overnight or over a weekend. Uh, so the construction delays uh, are limited. The, we have uh, three calls scheduled. Uh, they're on the upper right-hand corner for those dates if you're interested. Um, we always try to spend a portion of the call talking about some of the current activities which we're working on, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Um, recent ones we talked about, which was lighting as a service. I assume many of you have heard about these, but these are there's new as a service models. The concept is that rather than uh, burdening your capital expenditures, you essentially um, are entering in a different type of ownership uh, and lighting as a service is an example of that. We're also working on some Internet of Things research related to lighting. Internet of Things is using smarter devices. Um, easiest one to think of is your home devices such as um, the AI and uh, Alexa and the Amazon devices or even Siri and asking them to do things. Um, now you can use sensors and light fixtures to possibly interface with uh, how often a space is used or other types of beacons. We'll talk more about that in a second as well. We also use a portion of these conference calls for what we call crosstalk for members. Uh, the idea here is that um, uh, one member might be looking for uh, a solution or having a challenge. Uh, one of the a, quite a recent examples was the hospital was using a bi-level lighting controls in a, a, a corridor or stairwell and they were asking how their other members had dealt with that type of code issue before, and they were also able to explain it for other members where we will explain how they were able to deal with it. So it's uh, valuable information. It's not just 
um, one way, it's very much two way as much as possible. It is a PL uh, primarily supported program through Department of Energy. Um, also, we work on individual requests. Um, most recently, a, a retailer had some issues with, uh, with a color product um, in their uh, lighting in their store, and we were able to um, help them. Uh, ask, after they asked us some questions, we were able to provide them some feedback on things they should consider. Uh, similar, we were able to provide information about downlights and other products. Uh, typically, what ends up happening is uh, a member will say, I'm looking at this product. These are what I'm hearing. How does this match up? and we provide them just unbiased technical information as well as resources they can find. Next slide, please. As mentioned uh, in the previous uh, programs, we also have a campaign. You heard about it briefly, the interior lighting campaign. Uh, we have a 2019 recognition event. Uh, most recently, uh, in 2018, we recognized 15 organizations at the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, their conference in uh, Boston. Uh, we have a similar event in the works for 2019. Uh, the concept is here is it, with the campaign is that projects that are uh, significant energy savings and, and good programs, uh, they can be recognized. We have a submittal process. It's open now, but we really push that in the new calendar year. Um, and as mentioned previously, we are also looking to expand beyond just focusing on lighting, but how lighting is now interfacing with both HVAC and plug load interactions. Um, by integrating sensors directly in the light fixture, uh, the light fixture occupancy sensor can not only reduce, turn off the light fixture when it's no longer occupied, but also reduce the plug load or the HVAC as well. Um, we have many resources on our website for the interior lighting campaign, and we update them regularly. Um, specifications, utility incentive database, uh, case studies. Uh, we recently had a related webinar about a K-12 to uh, lighting uh, toolkit, and that's about to be posted there as well. We also have resources um, on the LME page. Next slide, please. Um, our, as I mentioned previously, we are working on the Internet of Things and lighting. Uh, this seems to be where a lot of interest is right now, and lighting is a mechanism to bring in IoT into a space because it's a mounting platform as well as uh, provides power. We found that some of the challenges related to IoT r relate to the lack of awareness of some of the benefits. Cybersecurity is always an ongoing challenge that has to be uh, addressed, cost, as well as interoperability. Um, next steps, we are working on a, a challenge related to the IoT, as well as some ongoing research. Next slide, please. Um, so the idea of this is a forthcoming challenge. Um, we are looking for partners, and we'll be reaching out to see if end users are interested in it. Uh, the idea is, is looking at a product, either a Luminaire or a Retrofit kit, that had connectivity and upgradability into the future. Uh, the idea is that later in the future, uh, when the product is ready, you could install a sensor, uh, both a light sensor as well as an IoT device uh, that might be able to do uh, future applications. And then they would also have to demonstrate how it would work. Um, but we'll follow up more with that in our next call. Next slide, please. We are also in the process of doing a number of field evaluations. Uh, this is taking equipment out of the field, out of the lab and actually demonstrating to see how it works. As I mentioned previously, uh, we are doing one with lighting and HVAC. This is a federal building using smart sensors um, and again, reducing the HVAC through the occupancy sensor and the lighting fixture. Um, we're also doing another one in Minnesota with uh, four LED retrofits both with HVAC and occupancy sensors. Um, but I also want to take advantage uh, of everyone on this phone call to also mention two field evaluations that we're currently working on. Next slide, please. One relates to a tuning of an LED system. The other one relates to PV. We'll talk about that in one in a second. So tuning, the idea here is that you can modulate the color temperature, that's the appearance of the light source. So over on the right, we call that cool source, that's kind of a whiter, bluer uh, light source over on the left you'll see more of the warmer tones. Next slide, please. And by modulating color temperature throughout the day, as shown in this type of uh, time of clock with time at midnight at the top and through the progression of the slide, um, we have found that, uh, next slide, please, that by modulating color temperature throughout the day, we can have different effects on the body, uh, both uh, perceived mood as well as some performance. So this is an example of it in, for, in a classroom where they had different types of, uh, again, color temperature. So it was the different appearance of the light source that could be changed through the different day when they were maybe uh, teaching a different subject or wanted to draw attention. Next slide, please. 
And so we are looking to seek out partners who might be interested in doing a tuning uh, <coughs> evaluation in an office setting. Um, it would require some consent of the participating in the field evaluation uh, just because we'd be seeking their feedback on how they liked working under this type of lighting that would change the color temperature throughout the day. Ideal building would have duplicate floors so it could be segregated. Um, also a standardized work shift with limited travel. Um, and we'd be asking questions about different energy savings of the different systems, the user's perspective. Um, why this is interesting is that um, there's often what we call the post-lunch dip, where people um, are a little tired after lunch. It's the whole point of the siesta, and by maybe modulating the color temperature and making it a, a little bluer or higher color temperature in the afternoon, we'd be able to increase alertness. And there are government programs as well as uh, uh, private programs that are interested in this type of research. Next slide, please. We're also doing another one related to a different technology. This one is photovoltaics uh, with direct LED lighting and battery storage. Um, I apologize, I think it's going to the next slide, but my internet connection is becoming slower and slower as this goes on, so I have a limited idea of what I'm seeing at the moment. Um, the concept here is that we would use photovoltaics uh, connected to a direct current uh, in the building. Uh, then direct current LED lighting in the ceiling and on-site battery storage. Um, the, the interest here is that uh, some re resilience aspects uh, to why people, why buildings, as well as obviously energy efficiency. Every time you convert between uh, DC and AC, there's efficiency losses. Um, but and LED lighting is really ripe for it since it's already um, a direct current technology at the end source, um, and so you can pick up some savings here as well. Next slide, please. Um, so similar, um, we'd be looking for seeking partners of this. We don't entirely know the ideal building type, uh, but small commercial is what we are looking for. Um, but they would have to have an interest in DC power, uh, most likely new construction um, as a result. Um, also, some limit effects on staff. And we'd be looking at both energy savings as well as how hard and the design challenge. So if you're interested, please follow up to either of these demonstrations. Next slide, please. So these are the many resources, I think, available um, across the different programs. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, so that wraps up our technology uh, team presentations. Um, these are just a few specific resources provided by each of our presenters, which you can access at any time for your use. Uh, these links will remain active in the slide deck on the Better Building Solutions Center. Next slide. All right, so now we're going to move into the Q&A session. Um, please remember, if you have questions, you can uh, put them into your chat box now. Uh, we've had some questions come in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with answering them. Um, so the first question is for Michael DeRue. Uh, one of our attendees wanted to know which company makes the HVAC air cleaning technology. Um, I'll answer that quickly. Uh, the company is Inverid, um, but they also wanted to know, is there any more information you can share about the Inverid air cleaning, recycling, and smart motors projects? Specifically, any details about the technologies and their case study um, pilots NRES is reviewing, as well as what NREL is reviewing for these two projects? Uh, great. So, so that's a long question, and I'll try to answer as much of that as I can. Thank you. And so um, the Inverid um, testing, we tested in uh, Miami and Houston and uh, Arkansas and New York, city and different office buildings in those locations. And, um, and then we have, we'll be sharing that technology or those results in our report um, that will be coming out, um, I, as I said, in, this, in early 2019. Um, I, and then, um, I, as far as recycling, I, I'm not sure what you mean by there. That the air, those cartridges that contain the absorbent material um, are right now. They're they're pre scheduling those replacement of those cartridges annually. Um, that's all I know about that part. The um, the the smart motor technology, um, as I get as I get as I said earlier, we're testing that in. Um, we tested it in a refrigeration air cooled condenser 
replacement. We're also under, so that's what will be reported. We're also doing some testing in our laboratory in a separate program with a rooftop um, air conditioning unit. That's all I have. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, I have a question now for Michael Meyer. Um, Michael, uh, I, it was mentioned um, that there's interest for a partner to study tunable LEDs in commercial settings. Um, and do you have any existing partners already for this project? Uh, if so, is there interest in partner organizations um, beyond the business organization you already have? Um, we are in initial conversations, and if, if anything is proven out, having multiple potential partners is the best way to go. Uh, just as we get down the line, we often find out either a building doesn't work or their organization decides not to. So we'd like to have, in the initial stages, as many conversations as we can. So yes, we'd, l we'd be very interested in um, speaking to other uh, interested parties. Thanks, Michael. Um, and so for that, if you are interested uh, in that study, um, Michael's email will be at the end of this presentation, um, and you should be able to just reach out to him directly. Um, Melissa Lapsa, um, I wanted to see if you can tell us a little bit more um, about the benefits of envelope commissioning. Um, uh, I'll stop there. Um, just describe them in a little bit more depth. Sure. The envelope commissioning is um, really just looking at um, the performance of the of the system as a whole. So, you know, looking more than just you know the the, the R value um, of the building. Um, but on our website, we have a lot of information that we pull together on commissioning and what the you know the benefits and the cost and you know it really um, is something that uh, we're trying to put a metric around to really look at all the different aspects of it and look at location and um, other elements um, regarding that performance to see you know, how can we cost effectively assess the performance of uh, a commercial building um, so that we can know where we need to make those investments cost effectively. Um, but I'd be happy to, as, as I mentioned, we've got links on our website with more detail and be able to answer any specific questions about it um, if, if there was additional need there. Great. Thanks so much, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, th this is a question for you. Um, the um, respondee noted that 40% of commercial building use is for plug and process loads. Uh, do you know how much goes towards plug loads and how much towards process loads? Oh, yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, um, actually, so there's not enough good data for us to know the breakout at this time. Um, and if we did break it out, we would have to break it out by building type as well, because if you think about um, process loads and you think about vertical transportation like an elevator, you probably have more elevators than, say, certain hotels versus um, versus a school building. Um, so uh, I think that's my best answer at this time, that we, we would love to look into this a little bit further, but um, don't know, don't, don't have the specific breakout at this time. Great, thanks, Kim. Um, Michael DeRue, there's another question for you. Um, are the energy savings associated with RTU controller technology mainly fan electric savings? Are the energy savings opportunities similar in cold climates, especially if electric savings also include compressor energy savings? Um, so yes, the, the the majority of the energy savings are from um, the fan energy savings. So the fan in a rooftop unit, typically in a commercial building, runs continuously at 100%. And so with the very with the advanced controller, um, you you put in a variable speed drive or a step speed drive and, and slow that down during ventilation and cooling one and then heating one and, and so on. And so there's that's where probably 75% of the energy savings comes from. And then there's additional energy savings potentially associated with the other advanced control like uh, demand control ventilation or uh, integrated economizer controlling. There's usually not much, um, maybe a little bit of energy savings from these technologies on the compressor side. Um, so in, in a heating dominated climate, you are gonna see energy savings uh, from the fan because 
you know, you're not going to be heating all the time, but there's a, usually a lot of time where you're just ventilating, and so you actually have a lot of energy savings there. That's where the most of the energy savings comes from. And then if you're in heating mode, oftentimes you don't need to run that that fan at 100%. Um, so you'd be running it at a slightly lower speed. Um, now there there are some technologies that provide variable speed compressor saving or control as well. But, um, there's only that's limited actual energy savings for most buildings, depending on your load and and um, the climate. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, I have one last question, and this one is for Melissa. Um, how much flexibility do I have in improving my envelope for an existing building? That's a great question, Cedar. And you know, this is at the heart of what we're doing on our envelope tech research team. You know, we're focused on these specific technology options um, that are cost effective and efficient for windows, walls, roofs, but most importantly, how the system works as a whole in, a, in the whole building context. So it really depends on a lot of things, um, looking at a commercial building, the size, use, location, et cetera. Um, but specifically, you know, if you're willing to change your facade or your roof materials, you're going to have more significantly more options um, for improving your performance of your envelope. So if there's a specific question, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we will, we will um, get our technology experts uh, engaged to answer that for a particular commercial building. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so we did have one last question that I wanted to address. If we're taking an integrated approach to energy efficiency in our buildings, what's the best way to get involved? Um, I'm going to take that one. I would say uh, join the Better Buildings Initiative. Um, you've seen today a number of ways to get involved, joining any number of our technology research teams, um, applying for recognition, and joining one of our campaigns. Um, uh, joining the Better Buildings Alliance or committing your organization to the Better Buildings Challenge, reducing your energy usage 20% uh, over 10 years. Um, so with that, we'll go to the next slide, please. We hope you'll plan to attend the next Better Buildings webinar on Tuesday, January 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. titled Prioritizing Laboratories to Meet Your Energy Goal. This webinar will focus on the Department of Energy Smart Labs Accelerator Program and the first steps for incorporating Smart Labs methodology into your organization's current management plan. Using lessons learned and experts in the field, this webinar will set up your site for creating a Smart Labs program. Prioritizing energy efficiency in labs can help organizations quickly meet their energy savings goals. Next slide. Additionally, we hope you'll join us for the remainder of the Better Buildings webinar series, where we will be taking on the most pressing topics facing energy professionals, with new experts leading the conversations on proven best practices, cost-effective strategies, and innovative new ways to approach sustainability and energy performance. Next slide. I'm also very excited to announce that the 2019 Better Building Summit has been confirmed for July 10th and 11th in Arlington, Virginia, which is located just outside of Washington, DC. Please save the date in your calendars now and be on the lookout for more information coming soon. You can stay up to date by following the 2019 Summit Week on, its, our, um, on this page, uh, as well as our Twitter. We look forward to seeing you in Virginia. Next slide. With that, uh, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our panelists today uh, for taking the time to be with us. Feel free to contact our presenters directly with any additional questions or if we weren't able to get to your question during the Q&A period. If you'd like to learn more about the Better Buildings Challenge or Alliance, please check out our website or feel free to contact myself, Cedar Blazik, or my colleague Kendall Sanderson directly at the email shown. I encourage you to follow the Better Buildings Initiative on Twitter for all the latest news. You will receive an email notice when the archive of this session is available online. Thank you for attending, everyone.